Today's video is sponsored by Rich Reviews. Rich Reviews now provides services to support our viewers in purchasing their own dream supercar. Our services currently include pre-purchase inspection, support calls and collection video to document you collecting your own dream supercar. More information in the description below. Hope you enjoyed the video guys. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to Rich Reviews. And we're going to do another video here from Goodwood. We're going to cover off the Amira. So to talk you through a little bit of the styling of the Amira. If you look at the Amira, you've got the air that moves through the front of the grille, which comes out and exits. There's side vents in the, in the bonnet. This assists us in the, aero, in the aero for the car and provides downforce. One of the bits and bones of contention is this rubber section that seals between the, the, if you like, the bonnet and the front bumper. Now this isn't actually a lift up section, so this doesn't actually lift up, but I assume that this rubber is there to add this cushioning between this large panel and the bumper. And of course, because the bumper is removable, you have to have some sort of seal there as well. So there is talk that this seal may be thinned out in the actual production versions, but we're not sure, but it's, a little, it's, a, it's one, of the, one of the few unsightly parts of the car in many people's perceptions. Coming to the headlights, the headlights are LED versions, so they're all LED. The wheels currently on these are the diamond cut, so they're the diamond cut variant. I think they're called the diamond cut pedals, so you've got the sections here which are diamond cut and then these are back to standard grey. This has got the black pack on it as well, so the black pack provisions the black pack provisions the roof in black and the side skirts. And in addition to that you've also of course got the black door mirrors. One of the things that denotes the first edition car is the fact that you actually have an Amira first edition badge on the side. So this denotes the first that this is one of the first edition cars. And in the first edition specification, you get a lot of options that are going to be provisioned later for the downstream AMG engine version. Um, but you have to tack them all on. You'll have to option every single item separately. So for the first edition, you get a lot of those options included automatically into your build. So even though the car is more expensive than the base spec, that base spec is very base and doesn't include the options that you'd automatically be provisioned in for the base spec first edition model. And because those items are delivered in as a first edition and because you have ordered a first edition, if you order a first edition, um, because you're providing confidence in Lotus, you in effect are getting a lot better deal. So those options will be provisioned for you a lot more economically. So they'll be a lot, they'll be, um, they'll be in effect financially cheaper for you in, in the long run if you buy a first edition car. So the first edition model incorporates a 3.5 Toyota 400 brake horsepower V6 engine. It has a supercharger to, to develop that 400 brake horsepower. And you can actually hear it when you, when you rev the car, you can hear it uh, whir, you can hear the supercharger whir as opposed to the buzz of course, or, or different sound that you get with turbos. Now you can also choose an AMG four pot turbocharged engine for this car. Um, that will be provisioned later, so that's from the base build onwards. You'll be able to spec the AMG four pot engine. And that, like I say, that would be a turbocharged engine. We're going to take a look at the inside and we'll talk you through the type of um, specifications that you can have on the inside. With regards to the gearbox, you've got the choice of a manual six-speed box or a DCT. DCT being dual clutch transmission, of course. Most people, it would seem, for the first edition are choosing manuals, but you do have the option of choosing the DCT for the first edition model, but that DCT would be chosen predominantly with the V6. So the V6, in effect, so to summarise, the V6 comes with either the DCT or the six-speed manual gearbox. Now, I've had a play around with the six-speed manual gearbox, and it's a very direct short-shift box, which I think is really cool. 
So Bovington gave it quite a bit of negativity when he was talking about the engine when he actually drove it on the test track. I don't think that was justified. The gearbox is very direct and it's a short shift, so it's a very short throw when you change it between the gears. But we'll go through and we'll walk you through that inside the car. Unfortunately, during the Festival of Speed, the microphone introduced an intermittent failure, so I will be performing voiceover for some of the sections of this video. From inside the cabin, the very first impression I got was an interior that is very luxurious in its manufacture. The fit and finish is very good. I would say it's comparable to a Ferrari, which I know is high praise indeed. It definitely has that high quality feel about it, which belies, I would say, Lotus of old. So I feel it's a real movement forward for Lotus here. Obviously here, I'm in a left-hand drive car, so you have to take that into account. Now, the important thing that you need to do is you need to make sure that you set up the driving position. A lot of people here talk about the steering wheel having a, quite a thick circumference. I found it was all right, but I do have quite a big hand. But if you hook your thumb over across the spoke, which is how you're supposed to drive these cars, um, the, the steering wheel felt very comfortable and not too thick at all. You can also adjust the steering wheel fore, aft, and up and down in a normal manner. You do this manually by unclipping a selector at the bottom of the steering wheel column. Now here what I'm doing is I'm setting up the steering wheel such that, first of all for driving position, and also you should set the steering wheel up so you can see the horizontal tachometer from the driving gauges in this top center section or in the top section of that cutout for the steering wheel. That is why that steering wheel is designed in, in the manner it is. That's why it has that shape. It's the same shape, if you notice, as the top of the, of the screen binnacle, such that you can see the horizontal tachometer across the top. So that is how you should set the steering wheel up and that is why it's designed in that manner. Here I'm overemphasizing the point. It doesn't actually take that long to line it up. Um, as you can see, I'm showing by example how I'm lining up this gap with the, with the top of the screen binnacle um, and the shapes and how they are exactly the same. In effect, that cutout is the same shape as the screen binnacle. Again, one of the characteristics I noted was that it was very spacious inside. There was plenty of room available. Um, you didn't feel constrained at all, hampered at all in your movement. And I'm about six foot two, and I thought that there was loads of room. There was loads of room available in the footwell. There wasn't any problem whatsoever. Most of my height is in my legs. I got quite a short body, so most of that six foot two length is in my legs. So I have to have very long footwell distances or very long footwells to be able to enable me to stretch my legs out and to be able to use the pedal box properly. And I had no issues whatsoever here. Gear selection in the mirror is very direct and it felt very much like the, the short shift golden rod setup that I'd installed into the 993S, into my Porsche 993S uh, before I sold it. And that has a very direct shift and you can feel it really engaged and it feels really positive and really, re really sporty and really cool. The clutch feels fairly heavy. In fact, I'm gonna have to move the seat forward, which is uh, quite surprising because I've got long legs. Most of my heart is in my legs. So the clutch feels fairly heavy for a sports car that may loosen up with use, but the gearbox is, is really sweet. It's really, really nice. I can see that that's going to work out great. It's a lovely sport box. I can't see why Bovingdon was, um, was having an issue with the, with the gearbox. I think it's, um, you know, yes, it notches in, but it's just very direct. It's a very direct notch. It really allows you to know you've located the gears. It's pretty cool. And you've got the track pads on the steering wheel as well to be able to locate and to be able to change configuration of the screen. The track pad on the right hand side enables you to actually scroll the different, between different sections on the screen. And in the center of that track pad, you have a button, which is like a selection button, if you like it. it, enables you to actually select items. So you scroll between items using the track pad and you press the button in the center there that I've got my thumb near. Um, you push that center section in, that little indent, and that ena enables you to actually select an item. So it's very usable. I mean, you never know what it's like until you're actually driving it. So the caveat on all this is, of course, is that I haven't driven the car. Um, so you don't really know what this is all going to be like until you actually drive it and see if you accidentally select any options that you shouldn't, that you don't want to select, as you can in the, in the Roma configuration, the SF90 and the new 296 as well, steering wheel configuration. Now, one of the negatives that has been mentioned is that the climate controls are set very low, very close to the center console, and it, it, they almost are, are impeded by the center console. As you can see here, they're very, very close to the center console. Especially if you've got big fingers like myself, you, you, you find it hard to wrap your fingers around those controls. So that is definitely a negative. I don't know why they set them so low. They didn't really need to, but they did. And, and so that's a bit of a negative. The center screen, 
a lot of cars have this nowadays. I, I don't agree with this sort of technology being in cars. I think it should be avoided as much as possible, but with the infotainment systems you have that are in, are in modern cars, um, Apple Play, etc., then you're gonna have these screens included. Um, with regards to the type of design and how, how it was placed and it's, how it was positioned, it was fine, it was in the center of the car, nowhere near as big as the trackpad-like system you get in the Roma, for example, and the large, incredibly, unfeasibly large screens that you have in, in the Teslas. Um, here I'm just playing around with a different configuration settings, don't really know what I'm doing, I'm just pressing buttons and just seeing how tactile it is. And it seemed very responsive. It didn't seem to be much latency. Um, these, these systems, these screens, never have the fastest processes incorporated in them. Why? Because they don't need to have, it's not safety critical. Um, and they, they tend to cut, manufacturers tend to cut corners by not using the highest end uh, processes in these, in these, in these um, items. Here you can see that I'm just using the normal finger gestures to, to control and navigate around the screen to zoom in and out, the normal pinch and spread fingers to zoom in and out, and the select with a single, with a single finger press and move around and, and drag and drop to move around the screen. No real issues with latency. It seems to be very responsive, no problems whatsoever. So looking further around in the inside of the car, you've got the sun visors. Interestingly enough, there's no mirrors on the sun visors, no pockets, which is quite a surprise. You've got the usual switch to allow the car to be towed, to be lifted from the front. Uh, and you've got an interior lights here. I presume start stop is automatically engaged. You have to keep switching it off as you do in modern cars nowadays. Um, with regards to the rest of the switch gear, so the buttons for the, for the mirrors, they seem fine. Um, they don't seem too robust, if I'm honest, um, but, but they, seem, they seem fine. Hopefully they'll, they'll last the, um, the torturous workflow that they're likely to get from people using them constantly. And you've got the door mirrors controls, door mirror controls here. And well, there you go. You've got the, the lock and unlock controls here for the car, lock and unlock for the central lock-in. Also no issues with opening the door, very clear where the door handles were. As you can see, the door mirrors were very well positioned on the A-pillar as well. Um, here you can see the passenger door handle very close up. And the door mirrors were very well positioned. You could very clearly see out of the door mirrors. Um, so no, no issues whatsoever there. Um, also, with regards to the cabin, you had this feeling that it was very airy inside. You didn't feel claustrophobic whatsoever, which was very important. Uh, also, you can see here that there's loads of room for the passenger as well. No issues and no constraints in the passenger footwell. Um, sometimes when you, get, um, no, when you get loads of space in the driver's footwell, when there's no constraints, you sometimes get constraints in the passenger footwell. Um, but there was no issues with regards to, with regards to space at all. And as you can see here, the, the cabin feels very light, very airy, and very well manufactured. Um, a very, very much a nice place to be. Yeah, I mean, a big thumbs up for me with regards to the interior. The switch gear, with regards to the, the headlights and the indicators, yeah, that could be better and it's not that great, but it, uh, it certainly functions very well. So yeah, great, big thumbs up for me. Very nice car, very nice interior. You're not gonna get a vast amount of luggage in here. And the, in the, the compartment, the luggage compartment isn't great, isn't very big. Um, but you've got some room there. It does provide some capability. You could probably get some good soft bags in there. If you squeeze it in well, you can get a fair, fair amount in there. And obviously in front of that, you've got the good old V6 3.5 supercharged Toyota engine, 400 brake horsepower. Unfortunately, that compartment is your only luggage compartment. It looks like the front lifts up, the frunk, as they say, lifts up, but it doesn't, it's fixed. What you also have, um, which you will have seen in the other reviews, is that behind the seats, you've got quite a substantial amount of storage space. Because you've got quite a lot of leg room there, you can keep the seat fairly moved forward. So you do have that room behind the seats. And you know, I'm six foot two, and most of my height is in my legs, but I still have the seat quite a bit forward to be able to gain access to the foot pedals. That's, and then obviously I adjust the steering wheel accordingly, so I move it forward. That leaves still plenty of room behind the, behind the seats for soft storage bags. So I think you could do an Italian trip in this, and this is something that we're thinking of doing. Um, we're going to be using the car as a normal daily driver and possibly doing an Italian trip in it, which I think would be really cool. Looking at the car close up now, I'm really pleased we put an order in. This is a really lovely car. Really belies the amount that you pay for this. The car's going to be around 80,000 on the road. I think you'll get an exceptional value for that, to be honest. Very good build quality. It, you know, when I close the doors, it reminds me a little bit of the 993. You get a nice thud, a nice clunk when you close the door. Yet it's not like a 993, but the car is well, very well put together. 
Um, hopefully the end delivered models are as well put together as these cars that they're showing here. The only thing I would like to see with regards to the build quality is this seal being de redesigned and being put together a lot more professionally than it is at the moment. Obviously that's not too great there, lifting out there. Um, but hopefully they'll sort those, that problem out, which I'm sure they will. But I love this design, these contours, um, which they've been able to work the arrow in within this design of the front. I mean, it looks really cool. So yeah, big thumbs up from me. Really looking forward to the arrival of the car. When we go through the configuration of the car, we go, we'll go through the configurator with you. So we'll show you on video when we configure the car. We'll show you the different options that we're choosing. Obviously, it's a first edition car, so you haven't got a vast array of, of options that you can choose. But we will provide a separate video for that, and we'll talk you through the process as and when we're ready to configure the car. With regards to when the car might arrive, at the earliest really towards the end of the year so september october time maybe a little bit later but as i said the key reason for us purchasing this car is mainly for the channel and it would be pretty much a daily driver so you would get some real experiences of the car of you of us using an, of us using the mirror so it wouldn't be locked up in the garage used every now and again it'd be used on a very regular basis it'd be used alongside the 458 so the Amira would be pretty much be our daily driver and the 458 would be our special car as it is now. So that should be pretty cool. I think that will work out really well. So we're going to close out the video now. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Say we've got fantastic new car coming to the channel. Let me know what your thoughts are. Give us some comments. Let us know in the comments below what your thoughts are with regards to us bringing the Amira to the Rich Reviews channel. If you like the video, then please give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Thanks a lot for watching, guys, and we'll catch you in the next video.